Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 113 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. One of the most captivating aspects of the Middle Ages is its storytelling. Tales from the medieval period contain everything from magic to morals to dirty jokes, often within the same story. Although there are loads of famous figures whose stories have been passed down to us, from King Arthur to Robin Hood, one who was just as famous at the time, although perhaps less familiar to us now, at least in the English-speaking world, is the figure of Renard the Fox. Through the stories of this likable trickster, medieval people explore the ins and outs of their own politics and their relationships with pretty much every tier of medieval society. This week, I spoke with Anne-Louise Avery, the author of a new retelling of the stories of Renard for a modern audience. Anne is a writer and an art historian who, when she's not advocating for disadvantaged children through art via her nonprofit Flash of Splendor, is researching the work of artist Edward Mitchell Bannister and still finding time to retell beautiful and engaging medieval animal stories. Here's our conversation on the history of Renard, his impact on medieval Europe, and how this tricky fox is still a relevant figure for us today. Well, thank you for joining me, Anne, to talk about this amazing book, Renard. I'm so, so excited to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. So you've rewritten these medieval stories, which is a huge undertaking. It's a big book. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the history of Renard the Fox, because I think he's kind of fallen out of fashion lately, but he yeah. was very popular back in the day. He was very popular. Well, he first, the first book really is the 12th century, 1149, a poem called Isn Grimus, a Latin poem, which was written in Ghent by a monk called Nivard. And that is basically the story of Isengrim the wolf and Renard the fox. And that's the first time Renard is mentioned in print. That's the first time we hear his actual name. I mean, before that, you have Renard, sort of a prototype of Renard in Aesop. So there are lots of stories in Aesop, which you can see the beginnings of this trickster fox. For example, there's a story about a lion who's sick who says he's very sick and he's in his cave and he asks animals to come and visit him and they troop in and Renard waits out, uh, well, the fox that becomes Renard waits outside and he says, I'm not going in there because I can see footprints going in, but I can never see them coming out. <laughs> so that's like the, one of the sort of earliest incarnations of, of Renard. But then this Latin poem is the first real canonical piece. So it actually comes out of Flanders. It really is a Ghent story at the very beginning. And then it goes to France and Pierre Saint Cloud writes his version where Renard's a bit more sort of villainous and dashing and sort of, you know, <laughs> French. <laughs> and, um, and he leaves it kind of open ended between the wolf and the fox. Their kind of enmity is just sort of left like nothing ever gets resolved. So he opens up the sort of uh, space for lots of other writers to come in. So there are lots and lots of branches of the French version. And then it goes into uh, German, and then it comes back to Flanders in the 13th century, back to Ghent again. And that's a, a chap called Willem. And he writes, actually writes a poem about Renard. And this is the sort of classic form that we know today. And uh, Willem we don't know that much about him, but it seems likely that he was connected with the Abbey of Bordello, which is on the Dutch border, and that he looked after lots of land for, I think, Margaret of Flanders. So he had lots of connections to the court and to the different houses of the of the great sort of monastic institution of Bordello all across Flanders, West Flanders, uh, East Flanders, sorry. And so he he had the the background to write all these intrigues of monks and barons and church and uh, state, really. He knew all the gossip and he knew all the intrigues and he had the education as well. But also I always felt when I was writing mine that I could sort of feel that he grew up there. So he, at one point, he was a boy walking along those roads, playing in those fields and woods. So you've got that as the sort of backdrop as well. And it's his version that goes through various different forms. It's initially a poem and then it becomes prose. And then Caxton picks up 
that version and he uses a prose version to translate in the 15th century and he publishes it in 1481 and it's that version that I translated so it has a long kind of history in Flanders. Yes and yeah. you've, set, you've set your retelling very specifically in Flanders which I want to get to yeah. in a second but this is this was such a bestseller as you're saying that the word for fox in French actually changed to Renard. Like I I yeah. thought like growing up in Canada we learned French pretty early and I didn't realize this was a character when you learn you know this is yeah. a dog yeah. this is a fox it was it was Renard which is kind of interesting and when I was reading this and especially the introduction where you're talking about how popular it is and the names and things like that all I could think about was Romeo and Juliet right where Tybalt yeah. is called king of cats or prince yeah, of cats yeah, yes and uh there's that line where they say tybalt you rat catcher will you walk <laughs> yeah so it's so entrenched in english culture then that everyone knew exactly who he was referring to yeah yeah and it's like, it's like I, I think i said in my introduction it's as entrenched as king arthur or any of these kind of folk robin hood everyone knew renard everyone knew all the stories all the characters it was so popular in France, as you say, that the change from Goupil to Renard. And then it became so popular in England, it was just a runaway bestseller for Caxton. He printed a second edition in his lifetime, and then it just went through dozens of different editions in the 16th century and the 17th century. So popular. And it kept being banned as well. It kept being on the <laughs> public, you know, bad list for books because Bernard was always dressing up as, you know, bishops and and making fun of the church. Yeah. So they had to adapt it in the in the seventeenth century, particularly by putting little expositions or, on each of the stories to saying, Well, this is bad because <laughs> you shouldn't do this because and this is why this is bad. This is why this fox is very bad, you know. So <laughs> <found> that. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. so popular. I mean, I ca I don't think Caxton could believe it really how popular it was. And I was yeah. thinking about it the other day, and it's just it was such an easy way for people to make fun of kings, make fun of the aristocracy, to make fun of people in power without getting into trouble themselves because they're just laughing at a, at a lion, aren't they, and a, and a fox, but. At that time in, in English history, so it's 1481, so you've got all the civil war and kings changing every five minutes and mm -hmm. all these machinations of power that are quite, you know, exhausting and frightening and difficult to know what on earth is going on. So having a text like this, where you're just mocking the kings, mocking the barons, you can see why people grasped onto it. Yeah. In London, merchants buying it and their droves so yeah. <laughs> yeah that's exactly it and you see pictures of these stories in marginalia before it's in print yeah. and then in print yeah. it's a bestseller and I really appreciate you mentioned this now but you mentioned in the introduction as well that having this come out during the wars of the roses right the yeah. tail end of that mm -hmm. such a relief and a release <laughs> for people yeah <laughs> you know? have something that funny and it really is funny and um so when I was translating it, I kept reading his version, Caxton's version, out loud. And the more I read it out loud, I realized that it was really written to be read mm -hmm. in a group. It didn't make sense. It sounded so much better when you read it to people. The rhythm worked so much better and it, it just seems so obvious. It's like one of those kind of organic kind of archaeological things. When you actually do something, you realize that's how it was meant to be, I think. So I can imagine that people shared it with friends and read it around fireplaces and, and just had a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you've kept a lot of that orality in this and you have some careful notes that mention that where you you have kept Caxton's bilingualisms in there and you yeah. added some of your own words <laughs> in there as well just to yeah. kind of give it a storybook flavor. <laughs> yeah, so it was very important to me that the world that Caxton had created was kind of kept that this kind of mid North Sea feeling, you know, it's not quite Holland, it's not quite Flanders, it's not quite England, it's somewhere in the middle. It's kind of floating between the two countries. So I kept in as much of the Caxton Dutchisms as mm. I could. I mean, all of them really. And um, and then I put extra sort of Flemish words in and middle Dutch words in. And then I put 
uh, sort of older English words that have fallen out of favour in as well. And I felt that there was sort of two sides to this method of translating. Like the first side was to keep the Anglo-Dutch flavour. But the other side was this idea of it being a sort of secondary world, like Tolkien talks about, that it's actually a discrete world on its own, that functions on its own, that has its own linguistic tone, that the animal's language should be slightly different from human language. So it should be slightly odd and it should be sort of have a slightly different cadence and a different sort of structure maybe. So I put in lots of slightly odd adjectives and lots of onomatopoeia made up words for things that just aren't in the dictionary that I just made up to give a flavor to you know one of the animals experiences so it's got those two aspects to it to its linguistic kind of tone yeah. <laughs> yeah I think it works I think it's definitely an older style of storytelling that yeah an, an older like we're saying an oral sounding storytelling style that you don't really see that much like kids books these days are very clean in their language and they're very pared down and yeah this has that older style but it's beautifully written so thinking about this as being like the animals having kind of a distinct language, distinct culture, you've still kind of put it over top of Flanders in a very concrete yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. why did you decide to do that? So Caxton doesn't actually mention that many places, specific places. He mentions a few, but I felt like it was very important to reroute the whole book in Flanders. And I thought it would be wonderful to reroute it really specifically in the topography of the Wasteland of East Flanders where it takes place. So I went to Flanders and I stayed there for a, a while and I visited every single place mentioned in the book. <laughs> and I also, I visited places connected with the Willem. So I went to the site of the Abbey of Budello, which is actually quite, quite haunting. It's, there's nothing really there, just there's, I, I walked around the countryside and it's slightly eerie and, and quite magical. And that definitely goes into the book. And I also went, spent quite a lot of time in Ghent and went, visited all the churches. And I went, I spent a long time in the, um, in the castle of the Counts, the main castle in Ghent, the Gravenstein. And I took masses of photos and sort of mapped it out in my mind because I felt that that was definitely the model for King Noble the Lion's Castle. So when I'm writing about it in the book, I'm actually writing about the specific castle in Ghent, you know, its proximity to the water, to the rivers, and what it feels like inside. And it, and it was used actually as a prison for quite a long time. So it was quite a sinister place within Ghent for many years. And it still retains some of that kind of feeling of danger, I think in its mm. architecture and in its walls or whatever. So that was really important to me. But basically repositioning, rerouting the, the story in all the places mm. in all the sort of original places. In the actual, in Caxton and in um, Willem, like Bruin just basically walks from the castle and he goes to Renard's castle and it takes him a while, but it doesn't really mention much of the landscape. So my Bruin you actually get him walking out and walking through the landscape and you get a sense of what it's like, what the land is like, what the nature is like. And then he ends up at Reynolds Castle, but that's now been positioned in a specific place just outside Rupelmond on the River Schelda, which is about 30 miles from Ghent. So I've actually given them specific places to go to and to walk through. And I think that lifts the story up a bit for us today. Mm -hmm. rather than it's just some fairy tale world that isn't quite real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does give it a lot of depth, I think. It seems more grown up that way, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that three-dimensional quality. So it doesn't seem like an Aesop's fable anymore. It no, seems like very no. tangible. And exactly. And I also I felt quite strongly about people in that part of Flanders who are very passionate about their fox. They love Renard. He's a hero to people there, and I wanted to honour them as well. That was very important to me, that I got it right, just exactly right. Yeah. And I mentioned lots and lots of towns and villages there. And, they, I mean, they, they have statues everywhere across that whole part of Flanders. I spent a couple of days just visiting all the Renard statues, and they're literally <laughs> probably about 40 in different places. Wow. 
just on little roadsides, you'll suddenly come across Renard and Bruin, or you'll come across, I don't know, outside a church, a huge statue of Renard. And it's, they're everywhere. And there's also a Renard Trail where you can walk across the whole of the land in his kind of paw prints. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really it's it's he's a sort of a national hero that really so that was very important it's funny yeah. that you mentioned first of all that there's a statue of him outside of a church because <laughs> that's, uh, he's always making fun of the church in the medieval tradition but also that he's a hero because he's not always very nice no he's not <laughs> he's, many times he's not nice at all no, he's not when you look at everything he's done you know he kills, he murders, he lies. I mean, everything is essentially immoral, but he's never arrogant and he's never pretentious and he never tries to be anything that he's not. And that was how I felt about him. I think that's why we we love him in the end. I mean, the other animals, Tybert, for example, is so... I mean, actually, in, in the original, it just says he's very clever. So I kind of took that and ran with it quite a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to. So he becomes a professor at Louvain and he's published many, many books and he's a complete intellectual snob and the worst kind of academic. <laughs> I, I have to say, I did base it on some people. <laughs> they <know myself. laughs> no, they won't recognise themselves, I'm sure. But And he's so pedantic and, and his great passion in life. I made his great passion be Boethius mm -hmm. because I thought, well, I thought it was quite funny that a cat would have that. But it's also in when he's actually tricked by Reynard, a lot of his injuries were actually the same as Boethius's injuries in, you know, in Boethius's, you know, his eyes pop out and, and Tybert's, you know, eye comes out and all this kind of thing. So I thought it'd be interesting if the cat is obsessed with Boethius, writes about him and then suddenly finds his own trajectory through the text is the same as his great hero mm -hmm. and also that sort of ties into everyone in medieval <laughs> times loving Boethius so much he's in absolutely <laughs> everything and also ties into Caxton's printing Chaucer's version of Boethius as well mm -hmm. so that was quite a big aspect of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I like all those layers you have a lot of footnotes that kind of reveal some of your thinking behind stuff like yeah. notes about Boethius and things like that yes this poor intellectual cat has a difficult time yeah as do many of Reynard's yeah. so uh, yeah. victims yeah so his victims are many and multiple but all of them really have something about them that is you could regard as a worse sin than Reynard's character you know he's very as I said intellectual arrogant Bruin is greedy and vain King Noble is cruel and narcissistic and bullying I mean all his victims have something that he uses against them to undo them that's sort of one layer of his victims other ones like the poor little hare Cuart and um, Chanticleer's children are just innocent little creatures that foxes always kill. So in that that side of things, he's just being a fox in many ways. You know, he is a fox. He's being true to himself. The other creatures have many sins that are worse than that. And I think that's one way that we can sort of understand why we can still like Renard. Mm -hmm. um, in my introduction, I talk about this mid-19th century academic who describes Renard as just being not being a humbug, not being having any humbug about him. He might be cruel, he might eat hairs, but he has no pretensions. Mm -hmm. And it's refreshing, <laughs> I think. He's a true anti hero, I guess. <laughs> yes. And this violence that happens that he inflicts on people. In the Middle Ages it would have been funny. Yeah. In a lot of funny. in a lot of ways. And when you think about it like these poor animals that have had such a rough time. It's not necessarily funny to us. So no. as somebody who's bringing this story forward, yes. what did you think about putting these violent incidents in here and deciding on whether they should be characterized as funny or not? Like, what was your thought process for I that? Think, I think I sort of emphasized the fact that Renard was tripping them up by their own faults, really. 
that was one side of it. I mean, also, I mean, they are inherently, they have funny aspects. I mean, the whole thing with Tybert and the priest comes out because he hears all this turmoil in the barn and the priest's naked and <laughs> Tybert kind of grabs his private parts and rips them off. And there's all this chaos and it's, it's very silly. I mean, it's sort of like Shakespearean farce, really, mm. rather than sinister violence. I think the worst one, was probably writing that was the hair though when he kills the hair but even then I inbuilt I built in the fact that hair had asthma it's not quite apparent whether or not the hair is dying of an asthma attack and then Renard kills him or whether Renard's just killing him and what's actually going on and it leaves enough openness for Renard maybe to forgive himself or to ignore him that he's done that but still Renard's quite shaken by that murder in the book mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's pretty disgusting. I mean, they end up eating him. The whole family ate this poor little hare and then his skull is put in a bag, a bell in the ram to carry back to King Noble and get in terrible trouble. So it's all quite sinister. Mm -hmm. And that's the only point in the book that Renard obviously feels a bit horrified at what he's done. The violence is normally, though, comedic. But bringing it into the present day is, is quite hard. And, and people were some people that used to my other stories about animals that thought, my God, this is really violent and <laughs> quite horrendous. What is she doing? Why is she putting this in? <laughs> but I think it's quite important to convey that medieval world, you know, and, and compared to today, I mean, it's not really very shocking when you think of television or novels today, is it really? So... Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because people will accept so much violence against other people in their fiction. <laughs> but yeah. when it's animals, yeah. it's another story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least yeah. for it now. Yeah, I was going to ask you what the reception has been of the book and especially of those moments with people so you, you find that some some people are kind of disturbed or at least surprised yeah. well, I think I mean another thing about the book is that it's the stories it's so varied like you'll have this horrendous violence and then you'll have Badger walking along a road and thinking about his sailing trips and then you'll have <laughs> Renard telling these fantastical stories about magical jewels Mm -hmm. and magic and talismans and talismanic magic and all that kind of thing so it's quite a varied pot of lots and lots of different things I mean I've had really positive reception to the book which has been really nice mm -hmm. but I mean in some ways I guess it's successful that people have been shocked by that violence it means it sort of pops out and that's quite important in Renard it's quite important that his violence is is part of his character and people realise that. I didn't want to sanitise the book. But having said that, there were certain aspects of sexual violence which I decided to sort of alter slightly. For example, Isengrim accuses Renard of attacking, raping his wife, Ursewind. And I felt from the beginning that actually Isengrim was a much nastier character and is obviously quite abusive to his wife, Ursewind. And so I decided that to change that from the original Caxton, I decided to make Ursewind actually have this sort of romance with Renard, a sort of strange kind of affection for him and he has for her, and he ends up helping her escape in the end. And I wanted to give her a happy ending mm -hmm. and also to open up some ideas about these magic jewels. <laughs> <laughs> in the book so I made I made one of them real and that he gives it to us when and gives her some money it's sort of a jewel that she can use to spend and then it's she escapes from Flanders and goes to the south of France so I sort of I just wanted to open up the story for the female characters actually and yeah change. I mean the sexual violence is there but it's the wolf that's performing it not the fox I'm definitely yeah. camp fox in that <laughs> Yeah, rescued him a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good choice to make because that would still have been funny in the Middle Ages to yeah. some people. Yeah. And uh, it's not the time not for that. Today, no. So, yeah, let's talk for a second about how you fleshed out the female characters because, again, <laughs> in many medieval stories, women don't usually have names if they're there at all. Yeah. Um, but you've given them a lot of life and a lot of agency in this. Mm. So, what were some yeah. of the decisions you made around that? Well, actually, I mean, Erstwind, of course, is probably the worst character from our modern sensibilities. She's raped, she's attacked, she's 
has a comedic name that just mm. you know so that was quite important to give her as I just said to flesh out her story but also Hermeline Renard's wife whom he adores and he adores her in the in the Caxton version it's really sweet and he loves his cubs I expand on this but in the Caxton version and the Willem version he's chatting about their you know how great they are he's so proud of them he's teaching them everything he knows you know and you have their names as well which is adorable mm -hmm. so I felt like it was important to emphasize his happy home with Hermeline because that informs everything as well because he wants to preserve that more than anything and in in Caxton his home is just kind of like a foxhole really so I wanted to expand his castle and so I sort of built it, really. And I thought Rupelmond, which is right on the River Schald, it's a very old trading town, was a good place to have, have his castle. So I built that there. And then Hermeline is kind of in charge of this place. But she also has her own career as a, um, <laughs> as a translator and as, as a linguist, as a philologist. And I thought that'd be really interesting to have her because you've got on the one hand, you've got Reynard, who is so adept at language. He's so adept at twisting language and sharpening it and planing it to, to exactly the right effect to achieve whatever he wants. But I thought it'd be nice to have Hermeline also as, as an adept in language, but in translating, in, in changing from one state to another and being a kind of negotiator between different languages. So I put her as, a, as really basically a, a proper academic, and the best kind of academic compared to Tybert. She's obsessed with her subject. She adores it. And she's always in her study writing and writing and working. And, and Reynard tiptoes around so as not to disturb <laughs> her. So I thought it was quite nice to subvert that as well. And she sort of has ink-stained paws and a little writing hat that she always has. And also it's a good way to introduce some Arabic, mention of Arabic texts, just to expand their world a little bit more. She's translating some sort of Arabic medical texts and alchemical texts just to let the light into that world and just let readers just realise that there's a whole Arabic world around them that informs them and is part of their life as well. So that was another aspect. So that was Hermeline. And then the ape, of course, is very important. So she is, uh, well, she's described as sort of Renard's aunt, but she's a sort of friend and, and she's a brilliant lawyer. And that is just present there in the in Caxton. It's amazing. I mean, her brilliance and her intellectual expertise is is there. There, you don't have to update it. It's already all there. <laughs> he gets him out of his worst pickle, and she's one of the cleverest characters in the whole book. So that was mm -hmm. a delight. So I could just sort of polish her up and give her a bit more of a backstory. So I thought, you know, it'd be nice if she had grown up in Bruges and had, you know, relationship with Hermeline and had long presence in Renard's life. But really, she was like any of the sort of brilliant lawyers that we know today. It was really easy to write her. <laughs> I but, like that. Yeah. And there's also the queen as well, the lioness. So she's, um, I thought it'd be fun if she had an interest in fishing. Yeah. <laughs> but she just goes off and goes fishing all the time. I mean, that's her main passion. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just wanted to give these different spins on, but also still having it within medieval world, within what people are interested in in that period in the 13th, 14th centuries, but just having that different accent on the female characters. <laughs> I like that part about uh, the lioness where she she has cultivated a sneer <laughs> yeah. so that she gets her ideas kind of pushed through without having to do so much yeah. work so she can yeah. go fishing. <laughs> yeah. well, I like having it situated in a wider world like you're saying like there's translations of Arabic and things like that mm -hmm. because I think that helps it retain the feeling that when these characters were created initially they were part of a wider medieval world where they were a commentary on what was going yeah, on. Yeah. So you've said that you you base at least the intellectual cat on a few people you know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like a lot of these characters still translate to today? Oh my goodness, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I think it's kind of probably obvious who I was thinking of with King Noble in some respect. <laughs> I mean, obviously, like there's people like Trump. And so many aspects of King Noble, 
are, are just so Trumpian. You know? <laughs> and and it was just and and also isn't grim that kind of the nastiness, the cruelty and misogyny that just mm-hmm. is constant within him. They're all archetypes. But very interestingly, they're, they're very unique archetypes. They don't quite match any other archetypes in Western folklore or canon. So I think, you know, that it's nice that they're being reintroduced because they do offer a sort of uh, model for people to look at and think about. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the history of Reynard. I mean, Reynard in particular, like when I, I think I was writing in the introduction about Goethe, falling in love with Renard when he was in the middle of a battle in the French Revolutionary Wars and um, just finding him so funny and so contemporary and just thinking, God, this is a fox of the Enlightenment. What is he doing in this medieval text? This is a fox for now. He doesn't care about the church. He doesn't care about the state. He doesn't care about kings. He is just his own free individual with his own free will and determination. And Goethe just absolutely loved that. So, and I think today it's the same thing. These characters transcend their time frame and are eternally relevant, particularly, particularly Renard. <laughs> Why do you say particularly him? I mean, the others have pati- their particular sort of, like I was saying before, their particular sins or problems or issues. But Renard, I don't know, Renard, because he's so determinedly himself, because he doesn't care if someone is a king, he still feels that he can still combat them and he has nothing really has no money has a derelict castle lots of cubs to feed he has no real position in court and he can still beat everyone and and equal them and he still feels equal to them so that's quite inspiring that's true and in a way that's kind of a a very medieval thing where you do have sometimes a peasant who just feels equal to the king but that doesn't always turn out well for them whereas this box. Yeah. He always it's just his it's it's a wonderful idea that it's just your own brains, your own minds that you can defeat people. You don't need the money, you don't need influence. He just manages to get out of these pickles, these terrible situations <laughs> with his own wits. I think yeah. that's what's so great. Yeah. <laughs> Where you, you feel like the trap is closing on his tail, but it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't catch him. Yeah, it doesn't quite, yeah. <laughs> for for people who listen to me on the podcast, they know that one of my favorite characters ever is Disney's Robin Hood. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's worth taking a, a second to mention that he was originally supposed to be Renard, wasn't he? He was. He was. They were, they, for ages, Disney, Walt Disney wanted to make a Renard the Fox animation, but it was so plagued with problems because of his character. He was sort of irredeemable. They could not make it square they thought this fox is never going to get past the Hayes code he's too anarchic and immoral and they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't make him not be without taking away his Renardian kind of character mm-hmm. so they kept, went through lots of different versions and eventually they just gave up and they decided to reuse the illustrations for Robin Hood so that's why <laughs> you've got Bruin in there you've got you've got Isengrim and and Robin Hood is just thinly I mean Renard is under the surface and I when people say god he's so gorgeous that fox I think I always <laughs> think well yeah that's because it's actually Renard underneath <laughs> Robin Hood, you're actually you know he's such a such a compelling character because it's actually Renard pretending to be Robin Hood <laughs> you know. Yeah, we love our tricky foxes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and also Hermeline, of course. So, um, you know, Maid Marian is is Hermeline, which is so sweet. Yeah. So I need to ask you, of course, then, do you have a favourite? So um, it seems like you have an enduring love for Renard. <laughs> I really like Grimbart, the badger. Yeah. I, I mean, Grimbart didn't have much about him apart from his love for Renard and his unshakable love for him. So I gave him a backdrop as a sailor as a keen sailor Mm -hmm. that's a nice way to mention a few voyages so I gave him I gave him some boats a boat in Bruges and I gave him a backstory of of traveling up and down the North Sea into the far north I don't know I just love that he's so kind and he loves his friends so much and he forgives so much but he he still admonishes Renard when he's really gone too far and he's the only person that Renard will, the only animal <laughs> that Renard will actually listen to, really listen to. And I thought their friendship was so charming and so, so lovely. 
but I do have, yeah, I really have a soft spot for Grimbart. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's very lovable. That comes across. Yeah. <laughs> So for people who can't get enough of your stories, you actually have more Renard stories that are coming out in October, right? That's right, yes. So the Bodleian thought it would be nice to publish a journal because the cover has been quite popular, very popular of the of the book. And so they're publishing a, a sort of a journal that you can write in, but with 10 little extra Renard stories in it. They're all like little mini stories, but they're based around the idea of Renard telling bedtime stories to his cubs. And I thought it'd be really lovely if the bedtime stories are old fox stories, sort of pre renard fox stories. So I've retold a couple of Aesop stories, but relocated. Well, I've in, in a couple of them, I've actually put them very much back into Thracia. So they're very much based in, on, in the Black Sea. And I've kind of put more topography into them to make them more kind of rooted which I like to do as in Renard and then the other ones there's another story that's a couple of stories that were in the French branch of Renard which obviously I didn't put into my original Renard so I've used those as well so there's a story about Renard and the eels when he steals lots of eels from a peasant's car <laughs> um, basically he plays dead on the road <laughs> this cart with all this fish coming up and he pretends he's dead and the peasant's like oh let's go and let's the dead fox it's, let's chuck him on the back and sell him in the next town you know and he just pretends to be dead and then he drapes himself with eels and jumps <laughs> off the cart and sort of runs away and, you know flies them up for his supper so that was one of the stories but they're all like little mini stories based around this narrative of of the cubs getting sleepier and sleepier and Renard sort of tucking them in and, and Renard sort of drinking a, a big glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> As many parents do. <laughs> That's just another aspect of Renard being such a good father. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, even the way you've described it, it gets at that kind of cozy storytelling that you've brought through the book. And so if people want more, they can check out your yeah. journal and it comes out in October yeah. and they can also follow you on Twitter where you have sort of mini <laughs> tweet yeah. stories every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. I have a, I have another sort of Fox that I'm writing about and I, that will be a book in the next couple of years, maybe I think not next year, the year after old fox but this is a fox that lives in dorset and actually i started writing these stories which is a sort of very cozy non-violent <laughs> in, in a kind of 1920s england when i was writing renard and it's i think i just i was writing them as a sort of relaxing thing to do after i'd been translating all this middle english and thinking all about Flanders, and then i just started writing about old fox and his friends so that will be a book in the near future but it's like a sort of continuation of this of the beast epic tradition for a sort of 20th century sort of pre-war england <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. lovely yeah, we'll have that to look forward to. And in the meantime, we have Renaud the Fox for people who want a new introduction to this old character. So thank you so much for being here to talk about him. Thanks so much. To find out more about Anne's work, follow her on Twitter at Anne Louise Avery. That's Anne with an E. You can also learn more about her work and support it at patreon.com slash Anne Louise Avery. Her book is simply called Renaud the Fox. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, we've got a couple of pieces from our columnists this week to tell you about. Catherine Walton is taking another look at Merlin, the famous Arthurian uh, wizard. And this one's about the prophecies he made. And apparently they predicted the future of England. Yeah, and everything else. <laughs> we all know the one where he says, a man shall wrestle with a drunken lion and a gloom of gold will blind the eyes of onlookers. Ooh. We all know what that means. Yeah, totally. I know so, what that means. But Catherine will explain all <laughs> in this piece. I would like to see that because it seems pretty nebulous to me. <laughs> Meanwhile, we got Sofia Andrade, and she's going to be looking at William Heron. He's a 13th century sheriff, and he was really, really corrupt. <laughs> That's always fun. Corruption and power. Yeah, that's your kind of guy. You love those stories. Indeed, indeed. My heart is a yonder. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Peter. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on patreon.com for supporting the Medieval Podcast. It's your support that makes this possible, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Patrons can choose from all sorts of amazing stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. To find out how to become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from foxes to fashion, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fabulous day. Bye.